Hello, guten Tag, welcome, willkommen. We're very pleased to see that there's so many of you here. Nice. There's lots of different people in this room today, people from the film industry and partners from funds. We've already met Uta and Mirja. I saw Markus Gersh from the MBM. That's about all I see. But that's a good opportunity to get to know them, talk to each other, update, simply talk. You already know now that one of the big funders is Creative Europe. They fund audiovisual projects in very different stages, really from development all the way to distribution with their media programs. In this context, I will say it's a wonderful invention that they have. The desks that help, it's not easy, but it's rewarding. The motto today is connecting talents, co-producing across borders. And for that, we have invited, we have wonderfully talented, of course, inspiring, creative guests here that will soon move to these chairs. You're going to meet them, we'll introduce them, and they have brought three very different projects here that we're going to look into. So this is what we're doing today. We will open the box, shed some light on financing and funding strategies, fitting to the projects, and some general do's and don'ts. We will hear something about funds, about how to finance things in general, what to do and what not to do in an international co-production. The other thing is, and that you don't know yet, is you're all part of an experiment today. We all are in this room. We call it the interactive panel. That means that we will have one of our guests on the screen here with us today via Skype. Let's hope it works. We have you, the audience, we have the guests, we have me, and we all want to discuss together. So this is not like we're talking here and then there's 10 minutes of Q&A in the end. No. Feel free to join in with your comments, with your questions. Raise your hand. Ah, there's Mike. No. That's not Mike, that's Jana. <laughs> there's Mike. There's Mike. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Hi. Can you hear us okay? Uh, yes, we can, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hmm. Can you hear me? Sort of. Um, how does sort of mean? It's getting better. The closer you are to the mic, the better it is, Mike. <laughs> okay, well then I'm on top of the microphone right here. Okay. Don't be too close because then we see our eye only. Hey, that's perfect. Okay, so as said, we are all an experiment. You, Mike, are also part of it because you're the on-screen participant. We all want to talk amongst each other. Well, <laughs> later. Anyway, there will be people with microphones outside. So if you want to join the discussion, please raise your hand, wait for the mic, and tune in. Now, I would like to ask our guests, the teams, to please join me on the floor. Bioluminescence, 
which is a fictional web series and a VR experience. And we're very pleased to welcome Abel Cohen from Great Britain, he's the author, and Katharina Biza from Renard Films, the co-producer in Germany. She's based in Leipzig. And Katharina, you told me that you met in a bar. Now that sounds very intriguing. I would like to know, how do you move from a bar to an international co-production? Um, I, I guess when we met in this bar, it was not yet about <laughs> the co-production. But um, yeah, I think it developed very naturally because the, um, the co-producer of this project is actually his brother. And I was studying with his brother. And like one year after the studies, he just called me and asked me if I want to do this project. And I briefly knew him already and pitched me the story and I said yes. So that's the sympathy thing, right? I mean, that's the thing, it, you need to sort of like each other, to work with each other, or at least respect each other. Yes, okay. definitely. Then I would like to move to the second project, which is Pre-Crime Calculator. That's Mike on the screen. It's an interactive app, by the way. It's Mike, Ro uh, sorry, Mike Robbins, the co-producer from Canada. Helios Design Lab, they're based in Toronto and Berlin. And we have the German author, Mikaela Knatschikova, I just learned that, for Klos and Co. They're based in Leipzig. And Mikaela, you told me your story has a prequel, basically. You met before. You worked with Mike before. Well, on another project. We worked before on, on like, actually, pre-crime calculator was the small app that we worked before, before, <laughs> uh, two years ago. And then from the small app that we financed <coughs> from our own money and uh, where Mike put a lot of his know-how and um, work labor, um, we developed, we are now developing and prototyping the pre-crime simulation, which is a game for desktops and um, also an app. And we are actually making um, now um, developing it into a geolocated <laughs> AR game. So let's see whether that will happen. We'll get into the project details in the second round, and we will also watch teasers. I promise. There's something for the eye. Last but not least, we have a classical project. I would say it's a fiction feature for young audiences with the wonderful title of My Extraordinary Summer with Tess. It's a German-Netherlands, German-Dutch co-production. We have Joram Willink here from Beinfilm and Marcel Lenz from Ostlicht, who are partners in that. And when I talked to Marcel beforehand, he said, how did we meet? Yeah, well, we're a dream team. What's a dream team in a co-production? Okay, did I say this? You did, I promise. Okay. Yeah, what I probably meant is that this teaming up um, was a very smooth one. So uh, we did not um, hit kind of co-production hell at any point, I would say. So we had struggles with financing and all the things you know from talking about popular productions, but we never had these issues on the uh, human level, I would say. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay that's see. a dream team, I agree. Yeah. Nothing to say about that. <laughs> okay, easy. Yeah. In the next round, I would like to now um, start introducing the projects. And I would like to start by rolling the teaser for bioluminescence. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that. Oh, it's kind of Sorry for that. Uh, here's the escape. No, I, I feel uh, yeah. disembodied somehow. <laughs> so? Of course. Yeah. 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 What are you guys doing? 
We're, we're trying to set up the teaser the of bioluminescence, and hopefully oh. you can see it too. Hopefully. This is a question for you. Can you explain briefly what this is about? I mean, it's submarine, okay, but what is it about? So um, the teaser you just saw is the teaser for a, a VR, um, slightly interactive narrative experience mm -hmm. uh, about basically humanity's mm -hmm. first encounter with an extraterrestrial invader in the oceans. Scary. Uh, yes. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's 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 in sort of like um, sci-fi horror kind of genre. Um, okay. And um, Madalina told me it will be about five to ten minutes long. That that's what you're aiming for. Yeah, we're aim aiming at like five to twenty. Uh, I mean, yeah, ten to twenty minutes. Or longer. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, because from from the current sort of like development stages all the way to the final product we might kind of have, the current content we have should be, should fit in 10 to 15 minutes, but okay. pacing, pacing permitting us maybe to go a bit longer if we need to. Okay, so you're flexible. We all are, are all at, the time. At this, at this stage, yes. Okay, and then there's another part to the project, which is um, a web series, right? Yes. Concept is 10 times 10 minutes. That's it. We're going to focus on the VR experience today, I know that, because maybe Katarina can say something to that. Um, you told me uh, previously that there's high interest in the web series, but a low interest in contributing financially to it, which is a common problem. So maybe you want to say something to that up front, why we are focusing on the VR thing today? Um, no, I think like the project we have, like its core is this bioluminescent story world. And so we were able to develop the web series and the VR out of it. And um, the problem is just that like in normal TV or on normal platforms, there is no, not really, there are not really slots for something like this. So this can go with platforms like Black Pills or like applications um, that do these kind of series. But um, as it is uh, like full CGI and we aim to have full realistic CGI, it's going to be a rather expensive web series. And so far, uh, alone in Germany, it would be impossible to make. That's for sure. What about the usual art? Thing on, because they are one of the very few that have already adapted to the concept of web series, at least. 
Yeah, yeah I know everybody goes there. It's it's complicated. We we're talking with them for the third time, so <laughs> I know. So there's basically there's no alternative. Or have you? What did German broadcasters say? Like Neat idea. It's Thanks. it's funny because like um, the project did some markets and everybody loved it, but nobody had a slot and um, like. Um, it's 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 changing like every four or five months that I'm I'm meeting with someone and um, most of them they say yeah I like it and I would like to have it but I don't know where to put it. Okay, so now you understand why we are focusing on the VR experience here because the series is in a difficult state because basically it's too modern, right? I mean this is what it, it sounds like to me. We don't have slots for things yeah. that we have thought up crazy situation. Now, the stage of production of your project is, I would call it, it's in development, but it's also in production because that's di it's different to film, right? Once you start prototyping, <coughs> you're already working on your finished product. So development is, at least that's how I see it, always a little bit production already. It's just different. Now, let's talk about money. I always think that's a little, it's interesting because we need to know what we are talking about. And then we'll move to the funding and financing strategy. So um, I'm very thankful that all of the teams have agreed to give rough budgets here so we can speak money, which is cool. So what's the rough budget of, um, let's say, both, and then uh, the VR experience? Um, I, I, I did not even like, calculate them <laughs> together, but um, the, the rough budget of the web series, it's 1.5 million, and only um, the VR experience, it's um, around 400,000. Okay, so now we know what we are talking about roughly. Um, I already know that Abel's brother is the lead producer. He's sitting in France with Equal Productions and maybe you can tell us something about the setup. So who are your co-production partners? And then you can tell me something about the funds. Um, so my co-production partner in France, he already did um, VR productions and he, he already did one VR um, cinematic experience together with Arte, which is great because this gives, gives us access to Arte and it's also important because the, um, the money that we can have out from Arte France is mm -hmm. completely different numbers that I could have from Arte Germany and also they are not on the same level and like investing in these um, projects, they're, they're just starting with VR but um, they're mainly in, in France doing this and not in Germany and I can co-produce with them so I need yeah, someone there. Better. So. <laughs> Which is great, and also my French partner. He um, because in VR, it's it's like the distribution. It's quite similar to to film because you have like these arcades in VR cinemas, but you also have um, the stores and everything, and um, which uh, is an advantage for me too is that he already did uh, take care about this distribution um, of his project, so. He knows um, quite well the market because for me this is the first. Yeah, this is the first VR project I'm producing. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm What's the name of the company? The company in France it's Eco. Okay. What, what do you mean by the stores? Um, the, um, the, the the Oculus store or the Steam what? VR, like the, the VR stores, the like the stores where you Online can Online. can yeah. use it like at yeah. home. There's a second co-producer in that, right? You told me that before too. Prefrontal cortex from Halle, who jumped in after um, realizing that it's a lot of work and that they've already invested a lot and with their own invest basically became the third co-producer in your package, I would call it. 
that's also something that happens sometimes. People work a lot and then they um, say, okay, well then fine, I can also be the co-producer. Yeah, I guess it's not only about this, but it's also a strategic uh, decision, of course, because um, they were the service provider first during development, they were not co-producers, but now um, they are in Sachsen-Anhalt and they have really interesting funding possibilities here, and they anyway were interested in stepping into uh, production because they, um, they are an important partner in this project, and so we decided to team up with them because uh, so it's expertise that they bring, right? And but it's also important point: interesting funding possibilities <coughs> that you do not have if you sit in Saxony and not in Sachsen-Anhalt. So strategic decision. Um, who funded your project? Can you give us a little bit of information on that? Who's in on that? <laughs> who funded the development? Like who had the idea, but <laughs> for funding, I guess. No, the um, the development was funding by uh, funded by uh, CNC in France and by MDM uh, here, mm -hmm. and um, yes, also with a lot of like deferments and investment by us because um, the funding was not enough to cover everything we, we wanted to develop. Um, did you get? Uh, when you applied for funding, did you get the sum that you applied for? Um, I got the sum that I applied for, but um, I think as I should say, I had to apply twice. Okay. <laughs> because yeah. it was rejected once, and um, then, yes, we tried to like pre precise the things and then. Okay. I already know that you also have the Kulturstiftung des Freistaats Sachsen. I cannot translate this to English right now. <laughs> um, also in it, which is interesting, it's a smaller fund. That no, we don't actually. You don't? We, we, we applied for it now for production, ah, but okay, we sorry. don't have a, a result yet. So. so you don't know, but you applied. Yes. It's, it's interesting to know because they also fund film and a lot of people don't know that. It's a cultural foundation. Okay, then I would like to move to the next project. So could you please give us an impression of pre-crime calculator? I try to. I just want to say it's just video captures, so don't expect like a teaser teaser. <laughs> it's uh, video captures of the environments that we built that Mike worked on the past months on. Which is now playing. You hear the music of Matthew Herbert, who is <laughs> the guy who is working on. Uh, we are working on another VR project. Yeah. This is like the real. Can you see it or you don't see it? Can you comment on this a little bit? I can see this. Can you hear me? Yes, but you don't see the you don't see the video captures that we are showing. Oh yeah. Can you comment on it a little bit? Yeah, like what see. what did you do there? Yeah, yeah. Our world building exercise here. Well, anyway, the, so basically, what we are doing here is. Um, this is the main uh, building, which uh, is um, where you will take a role of, of this data scientist, uh, repairing or improving the predictive policing algorithm called Agatha. And your task will be to repair those cell towers um, that you will find around your city. Um, you will, the, the first thing that you saw was actually taken from like real Leipzig streets. So we are working with, um, and this is something that Mike can explain better with uh, open street maps as well as um, deep, deep web maps, I think. I'm not sure how it's, what it's called. And this is called Busatron that we built now. Um, and yeah, you will try to solve a murder mystery um, in, a real, in your real city 
through real life data and you will discover how predictive policing and algorithms work. And, and also bear in mind too, it's, it's, it's sort of weird that you see this on the big screen in that these are actually designed uh, for the small screen. This is all, all meant as a mobile, a mobile app, a smartphone. So something that you hold in your hand to it and uh, kind of nav navigate through, through a city, the world. And, and, it's, and so I guess the process to date to create the has been a combination of uh, narrative, story, writing, and then cycling in with uh, kind of some more classical game world building, um, uh, sort of world building exercises, and then, and then also this sort of integration of, of, uh, of data and, and how to make, uh, how they actually all affect each other. So you built the world for the story to happen, and then the, uh, and then the, the data kind of informs you and, and, and guides you, and drives you through the narrative, and then the, uh, the narrative uh, in turn kind of opens up the world, so a circular activity. Can you guys hear me all okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It sounds like a complex endeavor, I must say, <laughs> or a lot of data and very digital. So if I understood it right, that uh, there's the game on the one side and the app is sort of part of the game. Did I get that right? Um, I think we'll, we'll be, we'll have, this will be also an app uh, at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, it, you mean the Brickheim calculator? That will, yeah, that's ready and that's been done a year ago. Like we launched it in 2017 with the documentary Brick Crime in Hamburg, uh, 2017, yeah, the September. And it was kind of it served rather as a prototype or testing. We, we wanted to test how it would feel, how, it, uh, how the people would react. We financed it from the distribution of the, and marketing of the film itself, so mm -hmm. it was self-financed in a way, and, uh, and uh, we, we, like at that time, it was when me and Mike met and, and, um, and with the uh, other two, two um, developer, developers and um, graphic designers, we, we built this small app through uh, and through also through the IFLAB workshop in the, in uh, in summer 2017, so that's that's how it all started, and then when we when we were pitching um, throughout 2017, starting in Prague, going through uh, cross video cross video days, and ended up in ITFA Forum 2017 in the central pitch. I think that was when um, the like the pre-ground calculator, the app, the small app helped persuade the funds to give us more trust and to build the bigger prototype that we are doing now. Okay, so you started out with a small app, prototype, and now it's about a game. <coughs> Can you tell me something about um, your funding strategy? I mean, you just started in and said you invested a whole lot yourself in building a prototype that you pitched everywhere trying to finance the game. Who was in as a fund for development of from the way beginning? So, I mean, we're still building the prototype. What you saw, that's a prototype. That's not, that's not a final product. Uh, I think we, what maybe what Katarina and, and, and Abel uh, can also talk about is actually I think prototyping is, is 70, 60 percent of the whole thing. Like production is not like film. Production is just tweaking the rest. <laughs> prototyping is all the work before. Backend testing, debugging, uh, you know, uh, developing the environments. Like it's yeah. so. So that's much more important. So the the, the first the small app. Um, wasn't really a prototype prototype. Like it, it tested a little bit of, you know, like, like, our re it, we made research regarding the, the, the algorithms, the predictive policing, how we can intertwine it into, like, an app. What, what could, what, how we could tell the story. 
So that was kind of like a small, you know, small, pro small prototype to kind of test the audiences, test the feeling, is their interest, and also kind of to show, look, we are able to do this on, that, on our own without your money yet, but if you want us to do more, then we need the money. So, and then that's where we, I mean, uh, we received- We understood this concept from the beginning. You don't have to be with us, but you can. Who supported the development of your, or the, f uh, the further development of your prototype well, aiming to become a game? Well, we're cur currently right now, right now we're uh, working uh, through a, a co-production, international co-production incentive set up between um, Made in Berlin, in, in Berlin and, and the Canon Piedmont in Montreal and Toronto, and what they, uh, what the CMF, one of the media firms, does is set up their international co-production agreements, and this is one of several. And so, what this this does is this this matches uh, producers and project in Germany with producers and projects in Canada, and often just enough uh, <laughs> to make it worthwhile. And not not to be profitable. So uh, um, that that's our sort of current sort of financial structure. And about as as we are playing the part, it's the projects. I mean, we've seen it go from being a literal kind of companion piece, like a second screen, in a, in a way, to a, a film. And that was that was the uh, incarnation as the uh, as calculator. And, but as, as we work on this, this project over the, over the last year, we might have become less and less as attached to a documentary film of its own end, and actually less of a documentary in, 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 in essence. So uh, our current strategy is, is, is to look outside of the, uh, of the funding structure is that Dell and I are used to work for more kind of public funds, you know, non fiction film, Oriented and funding, like the like the kinds of you mentioned with the earlier projects, the broadcasters and art, and we find that actually our our, our material that we make is, is actually uh, is perhaps less relevant to these to these these bodies. There's still actually strong content, sure, but then so uh, we start to enter into a new a newer world of game uh, publishing. <laughs> Let me move a step back, Mike, sorry for interrupting. Quality, you're a bit hard to understand, which is, I think, not, it's not because of you, it's, it's a technical issue. So I, I'm quite hard to understand. <laughs> oh, so, so it is about you, oh, okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> no, we don't shoot anybody. <laughs> um, what is the rough budget for this? <laughs> um, I will say that again. Um, well, um, basically, the, so the what what Mike was uh, talking about about the, the Canada Germany New Media Incentive, um, mm -hmm. I highly recommend it um, because it's also in a way in the um, how Canadian Canada Media Fund is structured is that they have this experimental uh, uh, field and and this is part of it. So they are not afraid to to give you give you the trust. Um, so that's one thing, but it's also naturally also his company, the Helios Design Labs, is, are not not new to in Canada. So so I think that was also partly why why we received it. So there was like the development that we received was seventy five thousand. When if we had to when we had to in, uh, invest on investment twenty five percent. So that's a little bit better than usually. For instance, Lady Born but in Brandenburg asks to match the money and Canada Media Fund as well. So they need private, usually private equity to, like if you receive, let's say 75,000, you need another 75,000 from private funds to release the money. So this is a little bit, Canada Media, uh, the German and Canada uh, New Media Incentive is a little bit nicer. And they know that, you know, we need a push or the project need, need, need more push. So, so you, you, you can match only, you, you have to match only 
And then we are looking at, now we're looking for about another 150,000 euros. So I think the budget is estimated about 250 to 300,000. It's actually very cheap for, but we know that, of course, we could do it for 500,000, but I'm very skeptical that we could uh, raise 500,000. Now, coming from a film background, I, I, at this point, I really want to ask you, where, where do you distribute something like that? I mean, it's obviously, it's not something for a screen in the classical sense, right? So how does, how does pub, how do publishers and broadcasters, do they, do broadcasters fit in here at all? I can say something and maybe Mike can add to it. Because I think, Mike, you can talk about the National Film Board of Canada, which is a different, a completely different uh, broadcaster than we know in Europe. And I would love that we, if we could have somebody like National Film Board. Oh my god. But anyway, um, I think Art de France is still, um, I think, a broadcaster that can, that, that is um, releasing game apps uh, for mobiles, uh, they are also interesting still in games. Regarding in Germany, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, because of the gaming structure, uh, currently also out of Germany is now, like until the end of the year, they will close the 360 app, what I heard during the, the Berlinale. Yeah, they so, launched things already. Yeah, so, so they will close the app, the, 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 the 360 app, but they will um, fund more like high budget, uh, high budget um, interactive content. So maybe that's also partly, I mean, I'm, we're in the same, exactly what Katarina is talk, saying, I've been talking to them for a couple of years already about both, pro about my VR project as well, about pre-crime as well. It's a long, it's a long talk. It's a long way. Um, so we're trying also to figure out whether we, we could make a deal with Art de France. With, and um, Mike can say something about the NFB. I, I mean, the NFB is the um, uh, not really broadcast, they, they, but then again, they are a distributor. They are a funder. Um, they are. Uh, it's sort of. Uh, it, I need use the public funds and and, and commission works, uh, um, but yes, like our and like the other, they have they um, they're not going to sell they, they're not going to sell the game, uh, but they can't. Uh, but they can they can't support it financially, and they do actually have, have channels. Um, I mean, our our new platform for a project like this would be. Uh, would be a combination of, of uh, uh, Google Play Store, uh, iTunes, and and the desktop. And and doing that I mean, this way too, this distribution form of changes the distribution platform from actually changes the way I think we actually start to look at the story. So it becomes less less not free. I mean, because the gaming world that that we is not really interested in in, in documentary. So uh, we have to take <laughs> take what started off as, as one thing and, uh, and see how it changes it to uh, something uh, closer to what you you saw in those those uh, those walkers. And uh, what I thought was really interesting, what Michaela told me up front was that. Um, it's also possible to launch something at a festival, and you're you told me about Sheffield Dog Fest, and you actually mentioned a sum of twenty thousand euros, which I think is very amazing because usually for a film you don't even get a screening fee. So this is a very different financing model that we're looking at. Not not only the uh, reaching the end consumer, where is this person sitting, if not in a cinema or in front of a TV but also who is the partner here. So I could, uh, to me it sounds very logical that a festival with a very strong AR, VR section as Sheffield is working on and has been doing great at, I think, is really interested in getting state-of-the-art new projects, <coughs> premieres basically, 
And then um, there's also the location-based model, which I also think is very interesting. I mean, that, that is something you don't think of when you come from the film world. It's, it's all very different. And sometimes I really wonder how long it's going to take to implement these kinds of, I call it products, um, in, a, in an old school market. But, but I, I think some of that, sorry, I think some of that has to do with the tools that you make you make it sound differently. Like I, I, I do believe that we, you know, in, in our current model of, of, of game development that we're doing pre-crime and VR development and elsewhere, is that the tools and the methodologies you use are, are, are a lot more, um, uh, I would say, uh, cheaper than, than film production, for one thing. Uh, you can do a lot more with a, uh, with a small team and, uh, and I mean, I think it's possible to do uh, to do something quite quite interesting and useful and great for uh, its money. Um, the one other thing, though, there is there is a bit of a, still a bit of a disconnect with uh, the content that might be pushed towards uh, an audience of Sheffield and the uh, the actual sort of market and the commissioners that would come to the market of Sheffield, which are still a bit old school. But I think it's good to, I mean, like the commission, like there's like the certain commissions from festivals or location-based um, exhibitors who basically Sheffield made a call, uh, we can commission a, a project for 20,000 if you exhibit it at the festival, right? So, so, and this is like what it's been on, Mike, for what, what three years? Like it's, uh, it's going on for three years now? The Sheffield what? Commission call? Yeah. <coughs> I think it's like three years. And um, so so the thing is, of course, it depends. You have to, it's, uh, you have only two months, so uh, it depends on what stage is your project and how you want to, how you want to in include it in as a location, location-based experience. That's why, because we work with real life data and um, city data, I mean, for us, it's just simple that it was it was on on the on the on the hands that we said oh we could make it an event a geolocated game for the specific Sheffield experience while during the festival so let's see I mean this is this was we just applied so let's see what happens whether they give us money or not but I think it could be like a nice like a good way to 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 also start up the pilot project for like licensing it through events and throughout other cities where you want to ha make it make, make it like it a, as a predictive policing tour see your city through through the crime rate in it which is very negative but i mean um it's the reality and that's a non-fictional factual storytelling that we're doing uh, we're not you know we are giving you the reality of it so there's a third co-producer also involved in your project, you told me, um, Ernst 3000. Oh. Or did I get that wrong? Uh, they, they were the guys who were helping us with the pre calculator, but they were service providers. They oh, okay. Co no, not a co-producer. I got it wrong. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, I would like to move, last but not least, to my extraordinary week with Tess. And summer. please. Yeah. My extraordinary summer with Tess. Did I, what did I say? Week. Which is a common So mistake. my summer is very short. It's no problem. <laughs> you know. In German, it's my. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> In German, it's Woche. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, obviously, yeah. I got it wrong. Yeah. What did I say? Summer. Denk je dat de allerlaatste dinosaurus Denk je dat de allerlaatste was toen je dood wist dat hij de laatste was toen je dood ging? Ik dacht aan later, als ik als laatste over zou blijven. Doe mee? Je fijne pauze. Bitte was? Je fijne pauze. Ich 
nicht verstanden zu haben. Denke ich an den allerletzten Dinosaurus, bis der Teil der letzten Masturide ausging? Ich dachte an later, als ich als letzte over zou blijven. Du mich? Want ik ben de jongste. into content because it's pretty clear what it's all about. It looks <coughs> enchanting. But please do give a short um, summary of the whole thing. I know it's a 90-minute feature film for young audiences. Uh, summary in how we develop the, story, the, the project or what, do you, what kind of no, summary? Um, what the, 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 is the film a first love story? Is it coming of age? What? How would you describe the content? Okay, yeah, well, we say it's a family film, and we, it's a story about, so it's not a children's film. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's made for parents and their kids. So okay. that's important. Family. Yeah. And there's uh, adult themes addressed. So what we do mostly in Holland when we make uh, family films, we take the children very seriously and uh, address the adult themes. So, um, and I think this film, in that sense, works. Uh, I think the parents and all the kids had a good time as well when watching it. Um, and that's also the starting point for me, for my company, and from the director. So we always work in that area. And um, well, I worked with the director on a few other films before. This is our four, fourth uh, film. We did two shorts and a fiction VR film. And um, it's based on the book. And the book was uh, released in Holland, was quite successful, and was also released in uh, Germany. My wunderbar seltsame Woche mit Tess. So now it's a Woche. Quite <laughs> summer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and um, uh, the, the story is quite interesting because the, it's not in the trailer. Um, the girl is looking for her father made a kind of trick to get the, her father into the island to test him, to, f to find out if she wants to say that she's the daughter of him. So it's the whole week of testing of her father before she announces it. And the boy is withdrawing from family. He wants to be alone and wants to, uh, well, he's thinking about being the last one, uh, like the dinosaurs. So he's withdrawing actually from making contact and she's making contact. So in the book, it's really smart that the, these lines cross. And that's why I think uh, well, the book and also the film works very well. So you already have a broadcast partner. Marcel told me that VPRO is yeah. 
we did. Co-producing this with you? Yeah. Yeah, we so did a short film with them, and it was really successful. We won an Emmy with that, and then the uh, broadcaster jumped in immediately when we had the book. And the uh, director wrote a, a very strong vision on the book. Vision. <laughs> and uh, they jumped in immediately, so we already had that from the start. Yes. Um, I know that you're, or would you like to say what the rough budget of the film is? Yeah, we always uh, discuss it a bit because we have uh, the hard cash budget and we have the budget with deferrals, which in Germany you love. I understood by this project. <laughs> my, my friends are really disturbed by that, but okay. Um, so let's say it's 1.7 million euros. I, um, we should talk a little bit about the, the funding scheme that you had here, because you are in, you're almost, is this film finished? Yes. Yes, about right? About seven, seven weeks ago, yeah. Okay, so is it um, already released in the Netherlands? Uh, no, no, it's, no. Uh, we, in November we got the great news that we could be in Berlin, in Generation, so that we had to run to finish the film. So seven weeks ago it was finished, and a few weeks later we had the premiere in Berlin, and then in Croatia and in New York, and in October it will be released in Holland. And you have a German distributor, Fogfilm, I already know that. Yeah. Okay. How did you go about funding this? I know that you were one of the first that received uh, funds from the German Dutch co-development fund that was set up between MDM and the Netherlands based on a treaty in 2016, I believe. Uh, yeah. It's a children, children co-development fund, so specialized in children family films. And the development, right? It's yeah, development, yes. focused on young or children's films and development. So this is sort of, uh, this was your starting point, right? Well, As I was working with Stephen on his first feature film, and then they, the, I found out about this fund, which is just brand new. And then uh, I knew the book was published in Germany, besides other countries as well. So that would be logic. Second, uh, the whole film takes place on the, on an the island in the north of the Netherlands, and there was a lot of Germans going there for holidays. So there is this audience, families from Germany knows these islands. So I thought there is also a market for it. Um, and I thought there is a way to make it work between Germany and Holland, content-wise, because there must be kind of reason to do the Germany. So we had an idea how to do that, to adapt things from the book. So, well, then I needed the German producer from this area, so. That's the dream team part. Then I found myself, yeah. That's your thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm supposed to finish, uh, uh, to step and further how this uh, whole thing <coughs> was set up. Yeah, the setup of the funding and financing. I mean, yeah. this is a big yes. part of the yeah, co-producing, yeah. so that would be interesting. So it's also about going into networking and, uh, um, you know, talk to people. So when it was in 2015, by the way, sorry to correct you, <laughs> and when the fund was set up, and uh, oh. we, we met in May 2015, the first time, uh, in the German pavilion uh, during the Cannes Film Festival, when Joram was just uh, um, coming in and was looking for a German... Um, potential partner, so, and it was um, also a good situation in terms of the stream team, because the MDM, um, you know, they have this, uh, the desk in, um, in the entry of the uh, pavilion, and uh, there is a changing system from all the German funds that uh, are running this pavilion, so, and at this day, uh, an MDM uh, employee was um, working there, and um, so it was a perfect fit to ask this woman um, what kind of uh, companies they might can suggest and then there's this list with all the potential companies to co-produce in Germany and then Joram just went through obviously this kind of a list and then they had to talk with the funds and then we... Uh, well, I said to her, I told her what kind of company I run and what I do. So then she shortened the list. Okay. <laughs> so, but then, uh, um, and then at the same time we met at the pavilion for the first time, and um, then you have this normal talk that the producer says, okay, I'm looking for a co-producer, especially in Germany, because I have a project, then you pitch the project briefly, and then I start to ask my general questions, more or less. Sometimes they have to be adapted because the project is asking for special questions, and then 
At the same night, I received uh, an email from Iran with um, the short films from Steven. And on the way back, I already had um, the, the PDF file of the book in my account. Uh, so, and I will still remember when I went back from the airport um, on the um, in the car, not driving. Um, I read this uh, book. <laughs> so, and I thought, okay, this is one of those films you really have to do because it was such a touching and uh, um, nice story that I had. Okay, I never read such a very beautiful story for a young audience and for adults, which is told in exactly the way you always try to find that, you know, parents don't get bored and the children are not underestimated by the story. So, and that's, um, and then we already saw it uh, um, still being in kind of shorts of Stephen and I thought, okay, so the mixture is right by the talent, by the approach of the producer and let's say the property, which is the basis for the whole thing. And then it was in 2015, there was also a good moment for the funding because the FFA um, and the Netherlands Film Fund, they just um, started an initiative by re-signing the treaty between the two countries and also they did try to elaborate the producers to work closer and more since the amount of co-productions went a bit down in the past. So um, this is a funny thing um, because later on uh, when we build up the financing strategy because it, uh, between the two countries. In Germany um, it was MDM of course because of this uh, um, Dutch uh, German fund. development yes. fund, right? We also had the FFA in it. I mean everybody who's working in Germany knows that the FFA is a more commercial driven fund but we had the feeling okay this movie is a bit like crossing the border. So um, it's worth to try it. Um, we also had the feeling it's a perfect fit for um, the slot um, um, at Kika because they bought a lot of productions from the Netherlands in the past and it's exactly this kind of stories you can find there. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we of course were looking for um, a distributor in Germany and we knew that the book was or was going to be, going to be released in uh, the Carlsen um, Verlag just in the next summer, so um, we thought, okay, there's a lot of assets in besides Perfect the conditions, also. actually. Everybody yes. was ready for you. Yes, so <laughs> this was the positive uh, <laughs> uh, um, starting point of the whole thing. Um, but, like, sometimes, sometimes even quite often, <laughs> the whole thing changed at the end, um, because the FFA rejected the application, um, the Kika rejected the project, um, so we had a lot of uh, uh, things that did not work out at the end and this is also the reason why you end up with all these deferrals um, back because then you have already a budget and uh, you have a financing plan and then you play this boring game of applying here and there and talking to the people and everybody loved it and everybody said yeah it's nice blah 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 um, and then you know we lost a lot of money in Germany because um, they just did not uh, came in. So, um, and the Berlinale, um, and the result, I mean, maybe the, it's not about the Berlinale so much, it's about the, the result of the film. So, um, that You don't have again. a German broadcaster in this at all, right? No. It's just VBRO no. as broadcaster and U2 and a bunch of funds, which is a bit normal in fiction features because they're slightly more expensive than documentaries. So you told me you have the Netherlands Film Fund, obviously, <coughs> you have the MDM, also obviously, and then you, this is a question to you, Joram, because I don't know this. Kobo, I've ne I never heard of that fund before anyway. So, um, so forget it. <laughs> uh, it's good money, but it's a lot of hassle. Put it what is way. it? No, it's a fund related to the broadcaster. So the broadcaster in Holland is uh, attached. They put in a little money, <coughs> the biggest money is from them. Okay, so it's like, is so it an automatic fund that you get if yeah, you co-produce with a Dutch producer, you automatically have Kobo money? If you have the broadcaster, the, the, the public broadcaster, then oh, the you have Kobo. sorry, right. Then you have Kobo money, yes. So okay. when we had the broadcaster... It's like Arte and the uh, automatic CNC that you get. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think yeah, so. Okay. But uh, the interesting is that by the vision of the director in the book, and our, our trailer history with the broadcaster, when we got the, the broadcaster in the beginning, I had a talk with Marshall that I already had money for production on the table. 
You understand? So. I have to add something. I yeah. have to. Yeah, but we come to the creative hero yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you something very nice there, which I, you I don't know about here. this project. <laughs> don't fret. <laughs> okay, shall I move into the creative hero part? <laughs> we have light as well for creative hero with all these elements with the broadcaster on board, which gives you access to the global fund and all the book. And the release in Germany was secured with Farb Film and in Holland. Um, there's also, we had a year of um, the European city was in Holland, in the north, where the story takes place. So we had all these European elements. Uh, and so we applied for the single, uh, single project money, and we got it, which was really nice. And um, so we could move uh, quicker forward in the development. Because we decided from the, from the start, okay, if it's a co-development fund, let's co-develop. There's some code told me too that the that there was simply an idea when you met. So that I think that's also a very lucky position to start from an idea. You didn't come with a script yeah, we book, or a book. book, right? Yeah. yeah, but you know, it wasn't so far developed. True. So you could really <coughs> develop it together, which is yeah. an asset, I think, sometimes in a code. Yeah, but there's also some people do this code developments and then just develop the whole script and then they translate it and. Uh, send it to the other right. Produ producer, right? What we decided from scratch is like, okay, let's let's do a co-development. Let's try to discuss as much as possible the script, which is difficult because then you have to translate several times. Mm -hmm. But we did that, and from that we decided, okay, if it's co-production, co-development, let's also go into co-distribution. So we kind of. Uh, Oh yeah, then, then came the point that, uh, well, this story takes place in summer, you have to shoot it in summer. Also because of the, the kids uh, working in labor law. Um, and we had a script uh, in the end of 2017 ready for finance. Um, then there's this small stage between script development money and production. There's production development money, which you could get from the fund to uh, start location scouting, casting, budgeting, etc. But if I would do that, I would lose like three, four months. So applying, waiting for the answer two months, and execute. So then I would lose summer of 2019. How did you cope with that? With the Creative Euro money. So we, we could move on, Bridging because we had that money, mm -hmm. we could move on. Uh, which was, well, in 2017, just before Christmas, we got the first production funding from the Netherlands and the film was finished uh, about a year later and released in Berlin so in one year time we finance pre-production etc so which is quite a run uh, but we had to it was like this summer or the next one and uh, we also I saw I thought that okay let's do it 2019 because then we have the momentum uh, also being the first coming out of this fund so we we had, to run, we had to run in financing. It was a pressure cooker financing, was it? So, yeah. And then you also have the Netherlands film production incentive in there, right? Which is a cash rebate, a tax cash rebate. That's also um, a special way of financing films that you can use. Canada does that too. I don't, in Germany, we don't do that yet, but I know that it's in discussion. A lot of people request this year that we also... Jana? No, oh, I, I got it. Mm. Yep, done. Oh, secret sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that makes it one, two, three, four, five funds in your project, if I counted right, which is actually not even so much. And you did a quick production, I must say. Yeah, it was uh, running. <laughs> Did you get all the money that you applied for? In no, no, we applied for your remarks as well, for instance. Okay. Didn't get that, okay. And the uh, FFR. <laughs> yeah, okay. To pay I, have, I have to mention that. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I ask, like, did, they, did they give you the reason for FFR and remarks? Because I... Uh, we had a very nice conversation, but... Yeah. For the FFA, it was really like... To be honest, it's... <coughs> I, I, will be, I will be open because um, I had a strange reaction on the script from the FFA 
um, because they did not believe in the script. So which is describing very much the difference between the two countries in a way. I mean, it's not always like this, you know, you can't say it's always like this, but the FFA, the, the jury, they discussed the script very hardly, obviously, and they did not believe that this is working um, at all at the end of the day, which is quite typical sometimes. Typical. So, specifically yes, specifically with, you know, let's say films that do not fit in a very easy scheme of saying, okay, you have this assets, you have this kind of storyline, you have this kind of dramaturgy. So it's, it's different, the film. I mean, everybody who has seen the film knows that this film is uh, special in a way, but it's very strong. And now, I mean, after Berlinale, we can say the film is uh, selling throughout the world, it's uh, going all over festivals. Uh, of course, for the, in terms of FFA, they have to watch the German market, they have to judge the potential uh, financially and uh, in the economy uh, way they think. So, But it was really not about this, it was about the script. So. But that's, I think, that not that part of the, the cultural thing that you have and that you have to understand? I mean, it's true, Joram, you said this in the beginning, that the, the Dutch have a very serious way of treating um, issues that children or teenagers have. Not everybody, country, not every country does that. Yeah, but I think also the difference is that we, uh, we're, we're kind of specialized, and so if you apply for uh, for money for development or funding for your uh, for your film, you have specialized people reading it. I think there's also a difference. I FFR, know you're getting FFR that. Commission, they read art house, do all the stuff in Holland. You apply, you get a, a specialized commission. Okay, so now, if I got the sign right, I know that we're running a little late. The audience is not asking anything um, funny. I have, um, I have one question that I would like to ask. Um, is How important is it, this is a question for all of you, um, to visit festivals and markets to find co-productions? Because you don't usually find them in bars. Unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe you have to find the right bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on festivals, you yeah. have time to go to bars. So. I think you really need to visit markets. Well, uh, maybe Mike Clinton asked her, but like, actually what I think, like all the films and most of the films that I produced and the, 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 the interactive content that I produce are co-productions. And I don't think... I, I think only one happened through a market. So all the rest was through connections. Okay. It was We're kind network. of network. So it was, I was looking for, okay, so I, I started like looking around for pre-crime, who, who can I collaborate with on pre-crime? And then my colleague from Close Home Call, Veronika Yanatkova, was like, oh, there's this comedian. I think you should work with comedians because they are, <laughs> you know, they are they are high in the stuff and they you know they have LFB. So there's this guy Frederic Dubois in Berlin in Berlin a Montreal guy who was doing web docs. So that's why she not, knew him. And so I had a breakfast with him and he was like, you know what? Like I'm not your guy. Mike is your guy. And so then <laughs> me and Mike <laughs> and Hank uh, has and his partner uh, a Dutch uh, uh, documentary filmmaker. We met. And we, it clicked, and I think with me and Mike, it was really the vision of the project, and that he completely, we understand each other, and we are also co-creators, so it's also a different dynamic, and we have the same vision, so that's super important. Do you agree, Mike? Yeah. 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 Mike yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, But I also think too is that I mean, in a, in our world, uh, what I was saying before is is that that the funding opportunities we do have are, are never are, are enough to make it interesting, <laughs> never enough to make it comfortable. And I think by by design or or by accident, I'm not sure which, I mean it, it we're more or less forced, I think, in a in a way to be uh, to be uh, to, to co produce. Because I think for us, uh, us the uh, idea of sort of monolithic funding sources doesn't really happen. And I think too though in, in, in our experience that that co-production 
I mean, with its, I mean, it, it's, I mean, all the problems of it maybe being unwieldy and in long distance, uh, over long distances, are more than offset by the, uh, I think, the inputs that that uh, you have creatively, but also the outputs that you have from uh, distribution opportunities. Like in our case, when we're, when we're forced to have those those distribution opportunities. So if we're if we're co-producing between Canada and, and Germany, this has to be good for um, for both projects or for both sides. So I should say one project both sides. And I do think there's a, there is a caveat though that um, that I mean I think that these these co-productions should happen not at the expense of, of changing your material, your outlook, or your or, or forcing something to have have kind of a more global, uh, universal kind of kind of thing. We don't really want to have like a uh, a, a one size fits all kind of story. Like I think I think these ideas of, of of localized stories are really important still, and I, I think that still has to somehow be maintained within these new structures mm -hmm. of of co-production. That brings me maybe to a question that we can use to, to close if there are no questions from the audience. And what's Actually, happening with you, audience? I have a question. Yes. I have the mic and I have a question. <laughs> um, maybe from, from your, I'm very curious, from your experience in international co-production, and you know, you don't have to talk about the last co-production you did, but is there anything you wouldn't do again? Or is there some advice you could give to the audience, which you know <laughs> factors you would um, watch out in future for? I have an advice, which we did a co-production some years ago, and we knew that we don't feel well with the people, yeah. and we had we had to make the decision either we stop it now, but then taking the risk to lose the film, which was really and we were the delegates. And this was really, probably this would have happened. So that's why we said, okay, we have to go with them. And it was, for me, hell on earth. So, and we, <laughs> my business partner and me, we really had this conversation very often afterwards that we said, okay, the only good thing about it is that we know why we have taken this decision, but we would never do that again. It's also the same with directors. If you, we had also this experience with a director. If you don't, re it comes out of your belly. If you have a really strong and strange feeling about something, which is a very important person or situation, Wrong. yeah, <laughs> take it serious, really. Makes sense, Katarina. Do you have something to say? Um, I guess like my first uh, co-productions, they were like with France, UK, but now I also did um, two co-productions with Arabic countries, and that's like completely something else. And I think the further you go away, or like the more um, differences there are um, between like the culture of your co-production partner and your own country, the, the more difficult it gets. Of course. Yeah. How do you prepare for that, though? I mean, you have to learn something about the culture before, right? It, because it's different. It, um, it's different in being polite. There's some rules that you can learn, I think. I mean, you can learn about how business is done somewhere. I've done co-production with Israel, for example. It's also not the same. There's different speeds in countries, I think. Um, there's different ways of talking to each other. You, who told me that? I think it was you that said it's so interesting that these British um, papers that you get, are they're full of words like amazing and fantastic and they're so um, marketing orientated that for a German fund, you regularly have to correct these papers and sort of put a little bit more seriousness in. But these are things that you, know before. I, I, I think that's interesting and it's things that you have to know. I, and I think that's a good question and it's a question that I want to ask you too. What, what do you, what, what, is, what is an advice that you would give? We talked about contracts too and protocols. 
contracts in front of us. Uh, just, I, had this, uh, I was told at some point, just to the uh, experience, never co-produce with someone who doesn't pick up your, the phone or answer your email back in 24 hours. And I learned that that's really crucial. <laughs> Yeah, well, like uh, Marcel said, I'm, you can work with a director or a co-producer. You have to, to test if it's going to work for the long term, right? So, what I I have I've also had some very difficult conflict situations in filming with directors, for instance. <coughs> I, and then I traveled for some time, and as I was thinking, like, what went wrong? And I went back to the steps before, and then I thought, okay, but on this very small occasion, this and this happened. It was like a forecast of what could happen, what happened. And then I learned from that, that okay, in this small email, people not responding or even behaving strangely or not on my type of working. Um, so I, I do some tests, kind of, <laughs> just to know what, what kind of uh, people I'm dealing with. I think that sounds perfectly, perfectly reasonable because we spend a lot of time with each other. And it's a, as um, Washi said, it's about trust too. You have to trust. You can, you cannot um, find everything in a contract. You have to. I mean, we set up smart contracts. We set up a lot of contracts, but you're never prepared with a contract for any kind of eventuality that will come. And this is when the trust thing comes in. And if there is no trust, well, then then is when it gets really hot. Can I? Can I just enhance a little bit on the contracts? It's, in the film business, it's a very personal business. So we work a lot of times with friends, and we've become friends over the years. From my point of view, contracts are really important to maintain the friendship, because you close them in times of peace, and then when things go wrong and all right, you then go back, dig it up, look at it, and think, hmm, actually that's what we agreed upon. Fine, so let's go back to that. And then you start from scratch, because contracts are really, they will not help you to prevent catastrophes and disasters. That's your job to deal with it. It's like, you just do it. But they help to maintain your friendship and your network. And uh, I just learned, uh, I, I'm working on another project with the National Film Board of Canada, and the National Film Board has brilliant project management tools. One of them is racing, a responsible, accountable, etc., uh, etc., et and the other one is called Decision Making Archive. So every time you meet, there is a spreadsheet which says what kind of decisions was made, why, and who did that. And this, if I had known this two years ago with my other co-producers making films, that would have, have saved me a lot of trouble, especially with budgets, like budget cuts. Like who decided this budget cut when, you know, and there is no, there is no protocol about this. So yeah, decision making archive, I highly recommend. And after some time, you recognize the pattern, right? And then you see it's coming. Like okay, ah, we need I to have like to, now. I have to be there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I'm just curious about your tests. Could you give examples? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, Test. It's not. It's not like I have developed tests. It's just that I'm the kind of person who just try to figure out what kind of person on the other side. But I'm also a guy uh, in the bar making stupid jokes about things just to figure out if somebody has humor or is, can handle me, for instance. <laughs> yeah. Like Roshi, she's like, "Where? When are you going to barbecue me?" I was telling me, telling her all the time. <laughs> Testing. <laughs> But also to the question, back to your question, um, well, if you would say it makes sense to go to festivals or whatever, so um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm part of a training initiative which is for upcoming filmmakers and it's one of the important things we always try to tell the young filmmakers that they really need to go, even if you will hate it in the very first two years, that you have to go to all this kind of uh, um, moments like this. You know, even if you have nothing on the agenda and you don't know why you should go there, but if it's about meeting with filmmakers and uh, funds and broadcasters, whatever from the region, just go there, even with no expectation, something will happen and you will know at the end of the day why you did it. And it's the same uh, um, as you described. I, I was just thinking and asking myself, 
did we ever make a co-production coming from a market? And I would say no. It's interesting because you watch a lot of projects on markets, but what happens next to this watching a project is really that you talk to the people, you meet them again, they introduce you to other people, and then you find another project and then you work, because um, I have to ask myself also as a Yara uh, mate. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> 2010. Yes, um, and I remember um, a <coughs> co-production we did um, that was set up in the co-production alliance. So uh, from my uh, classmate from Yave, she was uh, not the producer of the project, but she was approached by a fellow producer from her country. And she never did a co-production uh, within Europe in this kind of uh, way. And she asked, okay, do you have anybody in mind who could be a co-producer for the film? And she was mentioning a Danish uh, colleague, uh, obviously me as a German colleague, and then this producer uh, approached us and said, okay, you were uh, um, mentioned by producer blah, blah, blah. And this is how this world really works. Yes, and but that's evolution, isn't it? I mean, yes, but you have to start you're somewhere young, with it. You start, right, you start somewhere, you, you do go to these markets, you don't yes. know exactly what you're doing there, you just go, you start out with the networking. It, it, I think it takes quite a while for the network to talk back to you. Yes. That, that, that is exactly what you're doing by going to markets, yeah. talking to people, saying, hello, here I am, I'm interested, I want to co produce. La la la, and then after a while, the network starts talking back to you and sends you the project before they submit it to a market. <laughs> now that's cool, mm -hmm. but that takes a while. <laughs> I yeah, but, oh. Sorry. Yeah, but when you're in these markets, uh, there's all types of people, right? Like for producer, yeah. when I'm finding my co producer, I want to find somebody who's on my page. There's also kind of producer who are on a different way of uh, why they're in the business. <coughs> So it's, it's also for you guys, like when you, with what kind of producer you want to work with, right? So yeah. when I talk to people who want to work with me and I, they don't, didn't investigate who I am, what I did, and why I did it, they don't, then, then, it's, it's, then we're already on the wrong track because they didn't do their research, right? And on the other hand, I I'm, I'm want to ask the writer, director, producer, this kind of questions why they make films in the first place, why they didn't do anything else. All these kind of background information I try to get, like where are you from, why you went to film school, uh, did you do the film school, did you do something else, all these kinds of basics. Yeah. Just to, to get a feeling just, for yeah. somebody. Yeah. And their intention. Right? Exactly. Um, but <coughs> I'm gonna, uh, quickly say though that I think when you do go to markets, festivals, and, and places like this, I think you have to be aware uh, of uh, being in a situation where it's the usual suspects. And I think that, that can happen quite a bit. I think it's important to be uh, realistic and honest about that, too. It's like to, uh, to not go to a place because it's comfortable or that you know people. Because, I mean, I think the usual suspects thing <laughs> can, can, uh, can be very counterproductive. I just want to add to that, it's like when we go to Itfa Dog Lab conference and we have like our like karaoke night and it's like we all know each other and we have fun and that's it, but yeah. <laughs> Which is important, but, but then, then, then to be careful that, that uh, it, it goes beyond that too. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> That's a Beyond very sensible thing to say. Okay. <laughs> then you end up in a hotel room drinking champagne and making co-production deals. Exactly. So it's that. Exactly. 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 <laughs> you just have to get drunk enough. Hi. It was briefly mentioned in the pre-crime VR project, but uh, the question is for all the projects. Once you left the German market, um, did you encounter situations where private equity is important for the development stage? Um, that's the thing. I think with private or investors who are, I mean, they need to, to see the prototype. I think we are now waiting. What we are now doing now is uh, we want to present the prototype in a way that is presentable, that they will understand it. Because as somebody, I think Roshi mentioned it, don't show 
your project too early because you will kill it. So with the prototype, I mean, it's different with a film. You have a, you know, you have an idea, you do some research, you can go with it maybe, but with a, with a game, you need to do far more. So, so that's why like the, 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 the fund kick-started the, the prototyping phase and, and now we are finishing the prototype and then we will approach game publishers and some private, private, private equities to, to, um, to invest maybe, but also, also of course um, apply for further production funding. Does that play a role in, in your scheme, Katarina? Um, I, we were like thinking about approaching um, people in the UK, which kind of means, always means private equity because you don't have such a funding system there like we have, but um, like for the moment we have a very good plan A with French and German funds and even a plan B with more French funds, so um, we will try this first because like I don't have any experience in private equity and um, I think it's always, it's always um, complicated if you if you bind this person to you, then was this something that you thought about in in your classic production? I mean, something like impact partners, for example. I mean, they are providers of private equity money, basically. Well, I don't. It, it doesn't scheme, apply to this topic. I always right? dream about private equity, but uh, no. But um, and then you wake up. I we have impact partners, but they're not bringing in money. They bring in exposure or. Um, like, like uh, tourist board in North Holland, the ferry company. They, so they give us a rebate on the, on transport, but they also be a partner when we release the film. So that's not money, real money in production, but it's a lot of. It's in kind contributions. Yeah, right? but it's, it's worth a lot. I know. Yeah. So in the end, it will be tons of exposure uh, yeah. bring to the release. Yeah. <laughs> no, you wanted to say something. Well, yeah, in, in India, when you ask a question, which is yes or no, you get this, right? Yeah. Yeah. In Germany, you have, you have this. I, probably I did it wrong. It was like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we make a noise, but we don't yeah, say it. Yeah. 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 Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. You can do it. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, on top of what's already been said, it's general, like, um, things are organized. Like, it's a bit of a cliche about Germany, but things are well organized in general. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's been many experiences. I haven't, I haven't found them particularly different from the French. The sense of humor thing I very much agree with. But it's different. But all in all, like it's neighboring countries, so there's not that big of a cultural difference. There are some small things, but nothing that has impacted the work uh, significantly in my experience. Oh, good. Okay. Mike, what do you think? What's typically German? I hope I get away. I'll catch the first wall, I think. Except I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this actually is what actually I, I enjoy most about, about Germans is, is how puzzled they are when Canadians uh, I don't know, say sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that is, can you, you guys apologize? You guys are so puzzled now. <laughs> Germans don't apologize that much as Canadians do, yeah. I think that's a great. Uh, Schlusswort, as we say, <laughs> <laughs> we don't apologize. We're not. We've got something to learn in humor. We make strange noises without yeah. saying something. I have another one. Yeah, after three or four sentences, the Germans mostly say "oder was." <laughs> That's actually pretty smart. We don't say anything, and then we say "oder was." So it's back to you. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for listening, talking thinking, participating. Thank you. Thank you.